We're going to do part two tonight. Can God save America? Can God save America? Thankful for your prayers. I'm doing 100% better than I was this morning. I just barely could do it this morning, but I, I'm ready to kick the devil in the pants tonight. So let's uh, go to Second Chronicles 7.14, and we'll see a great, great promise. I call it America's last hope. It's God's call to revival. It's God's promise for revival. And he said, my word will not return void. Uh, it will accomplish what I send it to do. If my people, and each one, this is a recipe for revival, and each part of this is part of what we must do to have revival and to do our part to save America. If my people, that's only the same, which are called by my name. Not every Christian is called a Christian. At Antioch, they first called them Christians, which went followers of Christ because they saw that they were following Christ. Not everybody today is called Christians that call themselves Christians, but others see Christ in you. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, one of the hardest things to do, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And he's speaking about the house of the Lord. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. And then later in that chapter, he warns them, if you turn away, if you forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out in my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among the nations. God has pronounced judgment and curses on the people that forsake the Lord. And so tonight, America has forsaken the Lord. America's turned her back on God. We've lost our culture. We've lost our saltiness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 13, uh, 5, 4, 13, if he said, you are the salt of the earth, and if the salt have lost its savor, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. And then he said, you're the light of the world. So the cross of the church's mission to the world is to be a salt and to be light. Salt is a preservative. It keeps something from rotting, decaying, and going into putrefaction. Can God save America? He said he, that his people, which are called by my name, the first part, are you doing that which would cause others to call you by his name, call you Christian? And then the second part, humble themselves before God. So uh, what if people, what if people knew you like God knows you? How would that affect you and how you behave publicly? If you knew that people knew you as well as God knew you, I guarantee you something. There'd be no bragging. There would be no pride, and there would be no pointing at others. Because what God knows would put us on our face in the dust. And we got so much stinking pride because we think we got it covered up. But you have nothing covered up to God. You have a whole lot less covered up to other people than you think you do. Now, Jesus himself is the only one who's worthy of worship. 
Worship means worthy of it. Worthy of worship, praise, and honor, and glory. It was pride that made Lucifer into the devil. And the Bible says pride makes God stink in the nostrils of God. God said he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How can America be saved? How can America come back to God? He said, humble yourselves. We need to become like the man who said, I'm a zero with the rim knocked off of it. That's the truth. Compared to God's glory, majesty, honor, and righteousness, we are nothing. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, don't miss the point of our unworthiness, our, our need of humility. For by grace, that's unearned, undeserved favor. Are you saved through faith? That not of yourselves, it is a gift, unearned, undeserved. It's a gift, God. Not of works, but lest any man should boast. Our salvation is totally by grace, and it leaves no ground, no merit whatsoever for anybody to boast about it. And you can't say, I'm getting to heaven because I did this or I did that. The only way you're going to get into heaven is by the saving grace of Almighty God. Now, the world says just the opposite. Don't humble yourself. I had years ago a college student in our congregation. She went to college. Now she's smarter than a pastor. And I broke down weeping in the pulpit. I confessed my past and my sin and, and how unworthy I was to serve God. Well, she was standing almost with her hands on her hips at the end of the service. And she pointed her little old finger at me, her pastor now, and she said, don't you ever put yourself down like that again. Why? Why not? It's the truth. And the, God's the only one that deserves glory. And the, sure, that day they're preaching self-esteem, self-esteem, that's self-worth. Hey, it's Christ's worth. It's Jesus' worth. Doesn't matter about me next to him. I'm nothing. I'm a zero with the rim knocked off of it. And it says not of works lest any man should boast. Now, the world doesn't like you to humble yourself. The world wants to build yourself up, make you even equal to God, some of them. But all glory that's not given to God is vain glory. It's self-centered pride, and it's ugly, ugly in the sight of, of God. One husband said his wife was so ugly, she would scare the buzzards off of a gut wagon. Well, I want you to know when you have full of pride, you're ugly. You're ugly enough to, to scare the buzzards off a gut wagon. Amen. Isn't that good preaching? Where, where you find that in the commentary? Revelation chapter 3, the last of the seven churches of Asia Minor, was a, a, a speaks, I think, also of the last age on earth before the rapture. It's the church of the Laodiceans. And the Laodiceans, they, they were full of pride, stinking, rotten, low-down, loathsome, a maggot-filled pride. They were rotten to the core. They boasted, I'm rich. I'm increasing goods. And listen to this statement. I have need of nothing. And God said, wash out your eyes that you might see. He said, because you're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And of course, he was speaking spiritually. And they made a, and he said, you make me, I'm going to paraphrase it, he made, you make me want to puke you out of my mouth. In other words, they made God sick with their pride and with their boasting and so self-righteousness, which is unrighteousness. So humble yourselves. 
under the mighty hand of God, 1 Peter 5, 6, that he may exalt you and lift you up. That he may exalt you. That he may lift you up. Now, do you want to lift up yourself? That's pride. Or do you want God to lift you up? That's grace. So there's a high cost to revival. Second Chronicles 7, 14. To be called by his name, which means you'll be Christ-like. Which means, as he said in John 13, 34, you will love one another as I have loved you and by this men will know you're my followers my disciples by his name and then he said number two humble yourself humble yourself when's the last time you really truly honestly got humble before god humble sometimes it takes the death of a loved one sometimes it takes a, a death of a child or some other great tragedy to get people humble. The doctor to tell them they have terminal cancer and six months to live. Sometimes they get that gets them humble. Sometimes they lose their job. Sometimes they lose their spouse. Sometimes they lose their children and they get humble. What does it take to get you humble before God? Humble. With a broken, when's the last time you were really humble? Had a broken heart before God. He said, if we don't humble ourselves, he said he would do it. In 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32, in connection there with taking the Lord's Supper, said, you better judge yourself that you not be condemned with the world or I will judge you. That's what God said. If you don't humble yourselves, that's why he said humble themselves. If you don't do it, God will. And if God does it, you don't have any guarantee of uh, what God will do next. So, But if you humble yourself, he will have mercy on you. And he will forgive your sin and heal your land. I want to say something. Let's connect marriage to this thought of humility. Good, good marriages. Good marriages. Both partners are humble. Good marriages takes both partners to be humble. Humble before God. I want to say, with all honesty, I don't deserve my precious wife. I don't deserve her at all. And um, God help me if I'd ever let pride steal that truth from my heart. I don't deserve to be the pastor of Central Baptist Church. And if I thought I did, I think that would disqualify me and make me unfit to be her pastor. See, there's not going to be a revival in this land. There's not going to be any saving and calling America back to God without people genuinely getting humble before God. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, we are by what we are, we are what we are by the grace of God. I'm saved by grace. I'm called into the ministry by the grace of God. I have a family, a blessed family by the grace of God. Listen, Paul said, the Apostle Paul, the greatest New Testament Christian, he said he was, there wasn't anything that he did that was good, but it was the grace of God that God put in him. That's where the goodness comes from. See, you can't hide humility. You can't hide humility. Humble yourself. And that word, and that phrase there is in the continual tense. We are to humble ourselves and to keep on and on and on humbling ourselves. We should do it every day. Truly. All great men and women, and I've studied a lot of biographies in my 50 years, but all great men and women have something in common. They have humility. I've had the privilege to meet some great men, and every one of them was humble. Maybe not in the pulpit. They may have been 
spitting fire and brimstone, but you get to know them personally. They're humble, they're, they're humble uh, and they're meek. And I uh, thank God for that. Uh, Moses was the meekest man in all the earth, but he called down the wrath of God, didn't he? Second Chronicles 714 is God's recipe for revival. God's recipe for saving America. He said, be Christ-like, be called by my name, love one another as I have loved you. He said to humble yourselves. He said, number three, to pray. Pray, don't underestimate prayer. Prayer is the greatest force on earth. Prayer releases what God can do through you. God does nothing. As John Wesley said, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. Now, the word pray there is in the grammar. It's written in the definite article, which means we are to pray for something specific. God wants us to pray specifically, not in general, God bless America, God save sinners. No, that's not specific enough. And we can say those things, that's fine. I'm not saying that's wrong. But there needs to be specific prayer. I personally believe God wants you to have a prayer list of things to pray for to help remind you and discipline you. A disciple is a disciplined one. So many people just have some little poly parrot memorize little cliche prayer. And it never changes day in and day out. And uh, they're just like baloney. You taste blown on one end of the roll, and the time you get to the other end, it still tastes like baloney. And there's a lot of baloney prayers, if you please. So what, ask God. Ask God specifically. Ask God to do something for this spiritually cursed land we call America. Pray specifically. Ask, he said, and you shall receive. But if you have not, it's because you ask not, in James 4, 2 and 3. Or if you ask and don't receive it, it's because you ask wrongly. You have asked for that not in the will of God. How many of you, and, and I, I listened to a preacher this week, who said he speaks all over the breadth and length and depth of America. He preaches all over the United States. And everywhere he goes, he asks people to raise their hand if they have spent one hour in prayer for America. He says virtually no one raises their hand. Then he asks them, how many of you have prayed 30 minutes? There may be an occasional hand raise. Then he says, how many of you have prayed 15 minutes for America? And there's a few hands that go up, but the majority don't even spend 15 minutes a week praying for America. We have 168 hours in a week. And you mean we cannot find time to pray we find time for what we really want, and why can't we pray? The most important thing you can do for God and others is to pray, and pray God's will, not your will. So, prayer. Where does prayer fall in your priorities? You say, I'm tired of hearing about prayer. Well, God wouldn't keep telling preachers to preach on it if people would start doing it. Doing it. And I don't mean bless the food and take me to heaven when I die and that kind of thing. I mean, we need some intercessors. We need some prayer warriors that will storm the gates of hell and pray and pray sinners out of hell. Uh, not out of hell, but from going to hell and into to going to heaven. Someone said, uh, what you think about the most, is, uh, what you think about the most is what you love the most. So God says, you want me to save America? 
you want America to have revival, then love her, love as I've loved you so that all men will know that you're mine. Number two, humble yourselves. Number three, you've got to pray. God didn't promise to honor our activity, but he did promise to honor and answer our prayer. Amen. Every serious prayer warrior that I know has a prayer list. Has a prayer list. I remember uh, uh, David Gibbs, Lester Roloff was being tried. He was David, he was Lester Roloff's attorney fighting for the freedom of the church and the homes that he had and uh, for people. And uh, he said one morning, uh, uh, he said he would call him about, usually call him about 4.30 or 3, a quarter to 3 or 4 in the morning. And he said, you're up, aren't you? And Brother Gibbs said, yeah, Brother Oh, I'm just sitting here waiting on your call. And he said, well, I want you to come and join me. Uh, he says, we, we've got to pray. And he said he went in Roloff's room, and he had sheets of prayer lists scattered all over the bed, all over the floor. And he said, all right, Brother Gibbs, you take this half of the room. I'll take that half of the room. But one of the things that impressed me the most, he said one morning he called him about a quarter to three, and they had just had a, tr the, the, they were in a serious case. They were losing the case hand down. The opponents had 10 powerful attorneys. The jury, you could tell they didn't like them. The judge didn't like them. And they were being beaten, their socks were beaten off of them in the trial. So they had, to, uh, they had to dismiss to the next day. So that morning, Brother Roloff said, we've got to change things, Brother Gibbs. And uh, he said, Brother Gibbs, are you clean? And he said, what do you mean? He said, are you clean of all sin? And Brother, Brother Gibbs said, I knew when I pray, I, I get cleaner. But I don't know that I've been totally clean. And so Brother Roloff said, now I want you to, said, I need a clean turning, you need a clean preacher. So you get over there in that corner and you pray till you're clean. And I'll get over in this corner and I'll pray till I'm clean. Well, they got to pray and Brother Gibbs couldn't think of a whole lot to say and mur murmuring over there praying. He heard Brother Roloff crying out to God and kiss, confessing sin, like he could not believe what he was confessing. After about 15 minutes, Brother Roloff looked over to Brother Gibbs and said, hey, I don't hear you confessing any sin. And he put conviction on him, and he cried out to God. He said it, he had to get clean, and he prayed to God Almighty in his grace to show him how to get clean. He said, I didn't know how to get clean, but I prayed for God to help me to get clean and to repent as I've never repented before and have a clean heart. And oh, God, God examined him and how God brought things up before him. He never realized it was standing between him and God. They, one of the main prayers they prayed before they went to court was that God would turn the attorneys, there was 10 of them, against one another, and uh, the judge would get sick, not die, but get sick. And so, they went to court, and as the crowd began, the lead attorney said, Judge, we got a problem. He said, yesterday we was in all total agreement, but this morning none of us are agreeing about anything. We can't come to agreement, and even then, they started breaking out, arguing. One, man, one attorney said, said, this man does not deserve to be sued. It's not right. He does not deserve to be sued. And they broke out into an argument. After two hours, the whole case, well, and they said, we don't know why, but we can't seem to agree. And Brother Roloff whispered over to David said, you want me to tell him why? <laughs> he said, no, no, don't say nothing. And he said, I'm afraid that 
you then turn around and tell the judge he may be getting ready to get sick and go to the hospital. So I don't want you to say anything. <laughs> so anyway, after two hours, the entire case was dismissed against them. Who did that? God did that. God did that in answer to prayer. God did that because two men got clean. They just didn't pray a little while and get cleaner than they were, but they got clean. Have you ever got clean before the Lord? You may be like Brother Gibbs and right now not realize what that is. You need to find out. I need to find out what it means to get clean before God, to repent of all known and unknown sin. And I, I believe in confessing generational sins of our forefathers. I mean, Joe prayed for his children about their sins. So we need to pray. And Nehemiah prayed for his forefathers. We need to pray and get clean before God. We need a clean people. We need a clean church. And if our prayers aren't getting answered, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. So we need to see what it means to pray. America uh, uh, needs to get right with God. They need to get right with each other. And one of these days, if we lose America, if the church of the living God doesn't have revival, and we lose this country to the devil, then one day our children and grandchildren may ask us, Mom, Dad, what did you do to help save America? What did you do? Or what did you not do? What are you going to tell your children and your grandchildren if they ask you, what did you do to save America before America crashed and burned? Oh, we need to get right with God. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. And number four, seek my face. Recipe for revival. When was the last time you had an audience with the Lord God? The key word there is seek. Seek my face. When has God had your full undivided attention? I, in high school, I had an old history teacher boringest teacher I ever had but she was pretty open up in years but she was she knew history and uh she uh she taught monotone real slow i couldn't hardly stay awake because i worked the late shift at night and uh, anyway she would uh, get on to me and wake me up and i learned after a while that i better get up there and the next time we get to choose seats and get a front row seat if i want to learn something but anyway she would complain. People said, how are you doing? And before she had a chance to answer, they'd done gone. And she said, they didn't really care about me. And they didn't care how I was doing. What about God? We just call on God and then leave? Or we sat there, we listened to God. It's supposed to be a two-way conversation. We're supposed to pray to him. He's supposed to talk to us. When has God had your full undivided attention? The other day I went to my lung surgeon, had a follow-up appointment. And while I was in his office, he's sitting in front of me, uh, talking to me. I dozed off. I did. My eyes shut. And he got insulted. He got offended. And he rebuked me. He said, are you listening to me? Are you awake? <laughs> and no wonder people get impatient with old people. But I didn't, I didn't intend to do that, but I was tired. I don't, I don't sleep much at night. But anyway, that's no excuse. Here I had one of the top surgeons in the United States, and I, I wasn't staying awake. I wasn't giving him undivided attention. I only seen him for five, ten minutes out of, out of uh, six, in every six months. So anyway, what about God? How are we treating the supreme, most high? Holy God, the creator of the heavens and the universe. How are we treating the most high one, most holy one? Oh, what about that? How, how we treat and honor God? How much do we respect God when we pray? Are we giving God attention? Or are we just giving God a grocery list 
of Santa Claus list. What are we doing? God said, seek my face. You know what it tells me? God wants us to do more than just talk. He wants us to seek him personally. He wants us to seek him for himself. Not just what he could do, but he wants us to seek him. Seek his faith. For we need to focus. We need to make it personal. We need to say, oh, God, I want you. I want you, Lord. I want you. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, number of the last one, turn from their wicked ways. It's not the sins of the wicked that's the biggest trouble we're having in America. It's not the real problem. The real problem of America is the sins of God's people. And that's why he said judgment must begin at the house of, at the house of God. Listen, it's not the homosexuals and the abortionists. It's, God, it's God's people. God said, if my people shall turn from their wicked ways, so when you deny acknowledging your sin, that's a sin in itself. There's people that won't accept responsibility or blame for their own sin. They'd rather make excuses and blame somebody else. It's accuse and excuse, blame and criticize. Instead of owning up to it, as David did when he got right with God, he said, I have sinned. My brother James used to pray on Saturday night prayer meeting. It's not my brother, my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, that stands in need of prayer. Listen, some people won't admit sin. They never go get right with anybody. They never go to the altar to repent of their sins. And they uh, are full of blame excuses and all oh, they'll complain they'll criticize but we need to get clean before god and turn from our wicked ways there will be no revival in america if we don't take personal responsibility to repent and to turn from our sin our sin and when jesus died on the cross he would have died for us if we'd been the only one. I believe that because the Bible says so. But I'm telling you something. We need to pray like we're the only ones that sin. We need to get right with God, ourselves. We need to see ourselves. This is what I pray. Lord, show me myself like you see me. And brother, I said, not a very pretty scene. I remember... First time I went to Camp Zion, Camp Meeting Myrtle Suit, Mississippi, I never heard such glorious preaching and power and presence of God. The glory came down. There was 2,000 people repenting of sin, getting saved, worshiping God, sin-killing preaching like you never heard. And man, each day it seemed God's power got more powerful. And so finally I went to that altar and i felt like moses on the side of the mountain and i got down there on that altar and i said oh god show me your glory well i really thought i'd got there you know show me your glory and i want the lord's glory to pass out and i'm telling pass by <laughs> and do you know what happened god said all right i'll show you first what i see when i see you Oh, and he showed me my dirty, sinful heart. He showed me things that I took that wasn't mine back years ago as a, as a kid. He showed me lies that I told, misled people, mis how I mistreated people, how I let people take the blame for things that I had done, how I disobeyed my parents, how I disobeyed my school teachers. And God showed me things. Here I am, a grown man, a pastor of the church, 
and God goes down that list and he begins to show me a dirty, rotten, sinful heart. And oh, I wasn't saying show me your glory then. I felt like a, a egg sucking dog. I wanted to crawl under that, that altar. I wanted to crawl back to those pews and not sit on the pew, but get under the pew. He humiliated me. He humbled me. He brought me to tears and remorse and repentance. Uh, and I tell you, but you know what? Oh, God heard my prayer. I know he heard my prayer. He forgave me of my sin. He healed my heart. Uh, and we stopped to spend the night in Kentucky on the way home. And preachers are from the meeting, several of them, they weren't done going to meeting. They were still full of God. And so we met in a church house. And that church was a mission out of Mayfield, Kentucky, and later became uh, constituted as a Central Baptist Church. And But I was there when it was just a little infant. And... Uh, and I, they said, somebody pray. And I was the youngest preacher there. And uh, nobody jumped up to preach. And somebody said, what about you, Brother Charles? And I had a message. What kind of, what kind of wife does God want his wife to be, uh, his bride to be? And, Brother, I, I, I never had such liberty and such power to preach in my life. People heard about me shouting and praising God before I got home, and one person called to see if I got saved. <laughs> well, it was as good as getting saved again, I'll tell you that. But I got clean. Have you ever got really clean before God? Stay at the altar, that song says, till the light breaks through. Stay. Used to, the altar used to be called a mourner's bench, where people would mourn over their sin until the burden was lifted. My grandfather... He would pray till God lifted the burden of sin off of his heart. And then he had a shouting spell. He praised God. Oh, where is that old time religion? Where has it gone to? People that love God, people that hated sin and hated the devil. If my people, listen, if we do the things God said to do, he said, I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin. I will heal your land. Can America be saved? Yes, if we trust and obey God. And closing, have we lost our saltiness? If the salt has lost its savor, we're good for nothing to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. I remember years ago, we was, had a Christian school, 12 grades, and we would have chapel service at 10 a.m., and we had a preacher evangelist and always had evangelists preach at chapel. And uh, he asked my daughter Stacy if she had a large baby doll or a doll. Didn't have to be a baby doll, but a doll that he could use. And she said yes, and she went and got him a large doll. He took it to church that morning, and there we had some pews up front. He set that doll down on the pew, and then he began to preach about that doll. And he says, Ma, this is a good doll. She don't, she, look how modest she's dressed. She's dressed like a lady. She's wearing a dress she's down below her knees. And, Look at her top, it was up to her neck. She's a very modest lady and very clothed very well, very well. And look, and look at her, she's feminine looking and she's just sitting there, uh, very good. She's behaving. She's not doing a thing that's wrong and she doesn't curse. She doesn't lie. She doesn't steal. She doesn't commit fornication. I mean, this is a good doll. She's good. But then he asked the question, what's she good for? Does she pray? No. Does she read her Bible? No. Does she uh, witness the souls that get saved? No. What's she good for? What's she good for? And then he said, 
She's a good doll, but she's good for nothing. And he said, how many of you today sitting here are just, they're good, but you're good for nothing. And man, that message was convicting everybody. Finally, one of our teachers stood up and my mascara running out of her eyeballs uh, and streaking down her face. And, and she was shaking and, and wobbling like a broken axle. And she's uh, trying to wipe the tears and the snot. And she said, uh, she called his name. She said, brother, uh, oh, God has showed me uh, that I am good for nothing. Oh, that's what the Bible said. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to get clean, not cleaner. Most of us go to the altar and get cleaner. We pray at home and we get cleaner. But God wants us clean, a clean vessel that he can use, a clean vessel. We need to be clean. We, our church needs to be clean. Our preachers need to be clean. Our teachers need to be clean. Our janitor needs to be clean. Our soloist needs to be clean for God, for the glory of God. So God can hear and answer prayer. Heal our land, forgive our sin, and save America. That's our only hope. That's our last best hope, folks. It's right there in 2 Chronicles 7. 14. I want to ask you as I close, have you lost your saltiness? Have you lost your saltiness? And if you have, you're good for nothing. But to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. And that's why we need to get a hold of Second Chronicles 714. And we need to check off the list. And we need to stay before God till we can say, I call by his name. I love others like Jesus loved me. I forgive as Jesus forgave me. And I'm going to humble myself, put myself uh, down and God up. I'm going to exalt the devil. I'm, I'm going to see myself as God sees me and agree with God. David said, you're right and just, Lord, when you condemned him. He said, you're right and just. He humbled himself. And he said, I've sinned. And then we need to pray. I mean, we need to pray in the spirit and by the spirit. Amen. We need to get right with God and pray. Seek my face. Seek the Lord personally. Go after the Lord for personal audience with him. And like that song, Dottie Rambo sings, Lord, I just came to talk with you, Lord. I just came to talk with you. And all the other times I come to ask you for something. She said, she said this time, I just come to talk with you, Lord, and to thank you for all those other times. You know, we need to just talk with the, the Lord. Uh, I like a fellow got on his knees and said, God, uh, I'm not asking you for anything. I just want to spend some time with you. I want to tell you that I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you. And thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for keeping me out of hell. Thank you, Lord, for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I, oh, he was so thankful. But most of all, thank you. For you seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Oh, God's after our heart, not our, not our money, not our brains and an intellect. He's seeking our heart and wants us to seek him with our heart. Oh, Heavenly Father, how great thou art and greatly to be praised. What a blessed Lord and God you are. We can't imagine any way you could be any better than you are. We couldn't imagine anything better than your grace, your immutability that you never change from day to day. You're the same you've always been. Praise God, and what you've always been is good, good and full of grace and mercy and love. Uh, 
Thank you, dear Lord, that you so loved us that you gave your only begotten Son to die in our place for our sins on the cross and to, to, then to certify his death by a burial for three days. And then he rose up alive and lives forevermore, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And he's left us here that our people be taken out for his name to populate the city of heaven, the city of the bride. And then he said, you'll come send him to come and get his bride and to take us home. And Lord, we can't help but believe with all this going on in the world, signs that are fulfilled more than ever before, that Lord, your coming draweth nigh. Here, but help us, whether it be 30 years or 50 years from now, but let us live like it be today or tomorrow. Let us not put off today what we, or tomorrow what we need to do today. How shall we neglect so great a salvation? Save sinners, Lord. Keep them from going to hell. So, well, we can lost church members to realize they're a church member, but they're not saved. Lord, help them to get saved. And Lord, those that are backslide, marriages, Lord, that are not good. They're fussing and fighting and selfish and, oh, God, they're full of pride and, and self-centeredness, oh, Lord. I, it's such an ugly thing. I pray they'll get humble, humble before God, and, Lord, that they would treat each other and love each other like Jesus loves them. And you said for the husband to love the church, love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself to it. And for the wife to honor and obey and reverence her husband as unto the Lord. Oh, God, help us to practice the Bible, the truth, the word, and the will of God. Lord, we just close this prayer praying that you save America, that America be called back to God, and that your people called by your name. They will humble themselves. They will pray. They will seek your face and turn from their wicked ways that you might hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. In Jesus' name, for the praise of his glory and grace. Amen. Amen. Brother Robert, the sport and lady, we can boom the sick and so Jesus said he can to save you full of pity, love and power. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Come, ye thirsty, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorified through belief and through repentance. Every grace that brings you life, I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms, come ye weary, heavy laden. Lost and ruined by the cross, he will never you better. You will never come at all. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand Amen. We love you. Talk to you guys on Wednesday, Lord willing. Have a good night.